out in the desert, the sky is silent, the ground is still. At night, the Milky Way, our galaxy, is frozen in space. Space looks like a crystalline sphere. No sound. And look beyond to the galaxy spreading as far as you can see into the distance with the biggest telescopes on Earth and it is silent. And humans always believed that the universe was silent, that the sky was a crystalline sphere, that the Earth was solid, still and unchanging unless an angry God came to punish humans with an earthquake. But everything has changed thanks to one idea, the idea of inertia. What is inertia? Inertia links mass to space. Ma inertia is about the difficulty of making things move through space. Big things have high inertia, small things have small inertia. And the idea of inertia was put to use nearly 2,000 years ago. And that changed our understanding of our planet. This was done by Zhang Heng in 132 AD. And he, uh, what he did was to build a bronze urn. And inside the bronze urn, he hang, hung a bronze mass. The urn was attached to the ground. The mass was inertial, connected to space. If there was an earthquake, the urn moved. The mass stayed in place. This knocked a ball out of the mouth of a dragon, which fell into the mouth of a frog. And if you saw a ball in the mouth of the frog, you knew that there had been an earthquake over there. And he detected earthquakes 500 kilometres away. Today, that technology has been harnessed. Inertia has been harnessed. And seismometers monitor our whole planet. We hear our planet moving. We hear that the ground is not still. We know that the planet is a molten ball of rock with thin, thin shells like the shell of an eggshell floating on the surface of this churning molten mass. And those pieces of eggshell are grinding together, making earthquakes. We understand that the earth is making earthquakes all the time. We can hear the earth and today the earth is online. You can hear today's earth with one click on your mouse. But inertia is a mystery. It's been a mystery for a long time. There are still mysteries about it. But most of the mystery, one of the biggest mysteries, was explained by Einstein. The mystery is this. Why do massive things with huge inertia fall exactly the same as small things with small inertia? They do. And Einstein explained it. He explained it by saying that space is not what we thought. Space is not a crystalline sphere. Space is elastic. Play, space is like an elastic fabric. Matter tells space how to curve, and space tells matter how to move. Because it is space telling the matter to move, then inertia doesn't matter and everything falls the same. That theory was published by Einstein 101 years ago. The moment he finished it, in a rather complicated set of equations, he posted it out to his friend, Karl Schwarzschild, who was on the, uh, on the front, of the Russian front in the First World War, fighting for Austria against the Russians. Schwarzschild received the equations, quickly worked on it, and within a few weeks had a solution to Einstein's equations.
Einstein hadn't solved his equations, he had just presented equations. Schwarzschild solved the equations and, dis and found something extraordinary. His solution said that matter could rip holes in space, that there could be places in the universe where space came to an end, where time came to an end. Today we call those things black holes. In those days, they were called Schwarzschild singularities, and nobody particularly believed that they were real. They thought it was just something mathematical, and within two months, Schwarzschild was dead, and he wasn't able to defend his theory. But in the meantime, Einstein was trying to solve his own equations, and he found another solution. His solution was about masses going around each other like this. And he said, if masses went around each other like this, they would make ripples in the curvature of space. And these ripples in the curvature of space would spread out at the speed of light. But he also said, those ripples would be so small for any things that he could conceive of, planets, or big lead masses, or whatever you could consider, they were so minuscule that it was of complete academic interest, I mean, of no importance whatsoever. Forget it. And then later he even disbelieved that his theory was correct. And so it remained for 50 years until the first rockets looked above the atmosphere and saw huge sources of x-rays, x-rays coming down from certain stars in the Milky Way. Astronomers could only explain this as if there was a black hole next in orbit around a big star and the black hole was sucking the stuff off the big star and converting it to energy. That's where the x-rays were made. Suddenly it seemed like black holes actually existed out there. They weren't just mathematical, they were real. And if there could be one black hole, then there could be two black holes. And there could be pairs of black holes. Black holes going around each other, like this. If you have black holes going around each other, you might say, well, it's just the same as what Einstein calculated. But in actual fact, it turns out to be quite different. It turns out that if it's black holes, then when the black holes go around each other, they create such enormous bursts of gravitational waves that they can exceed the energy output of all of the stars in the universe. Something extraordinary. So, then came the idea, so 50 years ago, that there might be a gravitational wave strong enough to detect from some of those galaxies out there where there might be some pairs of black holes around the place that would be coalescing in that way. So that was what motivated scientists to start building gravitational wave detectors and for uh, 40 years we have been building better and better gravitational wave detectors and hearing nothing. The idea is that gravitational waves, ripples in space come in, they pass through the Earth and as they pass through the Earth, because the Earth has inertia, it will be wobbled. But Inertia has already told us that the Earth is vibrating all the time. And, the, and Einstein's theory actually tells us that even these huge, strong gravitational waves will still be tiny. And they will be much tinier than the vibrations of the Earth. So we had to find something better than the Earth for detecting those waves. And the idea that finally emerged, and for 20 years we've been building these detectors, consisted of putting some mirrors hanging, inertially coupled to space in the same way as Zhang Heng's seismometer, but in this case pairs of mirrors at the end of long, long vacuum tunnels, kilometres in length. And then those masses are like floats floating on the ocean. The ocean is, the, is space and they will be moving and lasers could detect the motion between the mirrors. The mirrors and the whole technology involved amazing new te technologies and innovations way beyond what was capable when we first thought about it. But eventually, last year, we managed to get build detectors, and when I say we, I'm talking about the thousand physicists around the world, 
And we were building, uh, the idea was that there would be black holes out there, they could be sending ripples of gravitational waves which would pass eventually to the detector where immense power of laser light was reflecting between mirrors and then if you listened at the output, you might hear the sound of a gravitational wave. In uh, September last year, we were just getting the detectors ready for long-term operation and suddenly we heard something. You've just heard the sound of black holes coalescing. Actually, you heard three sounds from three pairs of black holes coalescing about once a month in the last quarter of last year. And this one happened on Boxing Day. It was our Christmas present. It was our last present from the universe. Black holes getting closer and closer together. Finally, they're going 100 times a second and they finally merge together to make a single black hole. And that is an explosion of gravitational energy that is immense, exceeding by 50 times the power of all the stars in the universe. And we celebrated. And we celebrated in February this year when we made the first announcement. Here you can see the first waves as they came in. The detectors were two detectors in America, one in Hanford in Washington State, the other in Livingston, Louisiana. But it was a thousand physicists in the world who created these detectors. And uh, here are the, are the team from University of Western Australia when we were celebrating. I just, I went, it just went too fast. There you, so there you see our team. We discovered gravitational waves. Um, I want to tell you a bit more about those waves. The biggest explosions humans know how to make are hydrogen bombs, like this one at Bikini Atoll. Do you know how much energy that gave out? About 40 grams of energy, about half a Mars bar. <laughs> and the explosion that we discovered, how big was that? It was millions of Earths being turned instantly into pure gravitational energy. From half a Mars bar to millions of Earths. But I want, I want to tell you some other things about it. This thing, this event happened 1,400 million light years away. 1,400 million years ago. When that happened, life on Earth was a single cell organism. As the wave spread through space, life was evolving on Earth. And when it finally arrived at the solar system, humans Homo sapiens had evolved and worked out the theory of gravitational waves and built a detector <laughs> and... <laughs> and we heard the universe. We can... Uh, we hear the gravitational waves and we hear the distance, just like you can hear the distance of an ambulance by its volume. If it's very faint, it's far away. If it's loud, you know it's just outside. And if you can increase the, your sensitivity, you can hear them further away. If you can double the sensitivity, you can hear two times two times two bigger volume, eight times bigger volume of the universe. That means eight times more signals. So we're at a point where now little improvements and we can hear much, much more. But Gravity waves are also a lot like, or gravity wave detectors are a lot like ears. Ears are not very good at telling the direction of a sound. We can tell how far away it is, but we might not be able to tell if it's outside that door or that door. So uh, we have to find some way of solving that problem. And Australia is the place for solving this problem. Because the solution is by the method called triangulation, where you measure where, what time the gravity waves come in. 
If it comes in from the direction of Antarctica, it will get to Australia first, and then it will get the other detectors later. If it was coming from the north, then it would be the opposite. So timing allows you to pinpoint where they came from. So the world needs a detector in Australia to create these triangles to allow you to work out where they came from. But even better, we have a plan, a dream, for building a detector that's twice as big as the detectors in America, that will be four times as sensitive, and that would detect 64 times as many signals. It would detect about one pair of black holes every hour coalescing in the whole universe. So, what we found are cries from the past. Those cries from the past are just the first of lots of cries we're going to be hearing in the future. And these cries are cries from huge black holes that are 20, 30, 40 times as massive as the sun. And those black holes will, be, um, will have been formed from the very first stars, the huge first stars that are theorised to be the beginning of stars in the universe, the ancestors of our sun. So these are the earliest ancestors of our sun that make these black holes and leave them like time capsules to finally coalesce and allow us to decode what happened in the past. So that is the exciting future of gravitational waves. We can imagine then that we'll look into the universe and we, can, and we hear these gravitational wave bursts coming from black holes all over the universe. So we've, we'll be able to have an online universe, like we have the online Earth today, seeing space quakes happening throughout the universe, just like we had with the end, uh, seismometers allow us to hear earthquakes on Earth. That's our vision for the future. So now, when you go out to the desert, you can imagine the singing sky and the noisy earth underneath you. And all of that has been brought to us by that one idea, that idea of inertia. Thank you very much.